Pew TV, but it was a fun one about browser bring up. Only mention it because, uh, you know, we here at OpenZD, we use Restream to do our streaming. And there's a little button up there that says start to stream. And um, I don't know if you're aware of this whole, like, uh, uh, not boomers, but like Gen Xers do the pause. Have you ever heard of the streamer pause? Mm, it doesn't quite, doesn't actually ring a bell. So what, what basically what happens is a, um, uh, person of a certain age will, will sit there and, and just stare at the screen for a certain amount of time before actually starting the stream. And so the younger generation, uh, chastises and makes fun of the older people like myself, who just sit there and do that because they don't really, you know, us, us older people, we're waiting for the thing to turn on. Cause like, you know, it used to take so long when we were younger. And so last week I wanted to eliminate this. I wanted to be, you know, part of the cool gang. And so when the restream thing said, go, I went like I went immediately. And then I went and I watched the, the Is this after. thing on. I went exactly, exactly, you know, dunk, dunk, dunk. Um, so <laughs> I think I went, we're live. <laughs> so I went and I watched the stream afterwards and a hundred percent, like it cut off the first like five seconds. So <laughs> oh, I think we did the same thing. Cause the little light didn't even come on until a few seconds after you. Started. So who knows how this one will turn out, but you know, we're, you know, it's always fun. Uh, today on ZDTV, I think it's going to be a fun one. Uh, we've got a special guest star. Uh, Mr. Mike Guthrie. I see him sitting behind the scenes. Ken, how was your week off? Was it good? Oh, it was relaxing. This was one of the good ones. You know, not one of the sad yeah. vacations. Sure, this was, sure. It was a good vacation. Family, gathering, rental house at the lake, playing on the water, boat, sunburn. Awesome. Fantastic sunburns. That's a thing of the past for my children. My, they've never had a sunburn before because we've <laughs> been um, adamant, we, adamant about sunblock. Until this last, you know, now the child is old enough to, to think for himself. <laughs> I warned you. And so, and so he's like, I, I'm good. I'm like impervious to sun, to sun uh, burn. And we uh, went to Florida and yeah. he, you know, his whole back was peeling. <laughs> All right. So today on ZDTV, we got a user spotlight, a fun one. Like I alluded to, we're going to spotlight Ned Foundry, right? Like that sounds like yeah. fun, doesn't it? Uh, normally you wouldn't think of, uh, somebody who works in the same company as us as an, a, a user spotlight, but I mean, we are a user, right? Well, we, we most definitely use our own software. And so, um, I was asking around, Hey, does anybody want to come and do a ZDTV? And our friend, Mike Guthrie said, yeah, I'll do a ZDTV. And so I think we can bring Mike on and say, hi, hi hey, Mike, hey, we're live. Bro. Awesome. So Mike uh, is going to hopefully share his screen today at some point, and that's why uh, he wasn't here at the beginning. So hopefully all the permissions are sorted, and if not, then you know we'll figure it out when it goes live. But thanks for coming back, Mike. Always interested in uh, having you here to see what kind of things you're particularly doing with OpenZD, or I should say we, I guess, are doing with OpenZD, right? So... Um, when I put the feelers out this week amongst the team saying, Hey, somebody want to do a ZDTV, you said, ah, I could do, I could do one. Uh, what, what, can you recap for us what it is that, uh, you offered to do? Yeah. So I actually wanted to highlight, um, uh, something kind of in the ZD ecosystem that's become one of my, one of my favorite tools. Uh, it's actually, uh, some of Ken Bingham's handiwork actually that I got to take advantage of. Um, it's the ZD host container. Um, and this is a a container where um, you don't need it to do any type of intercepting of traffic, but you only need it to host a service. Um, it's very, very lightweight and you can drop it just about anywhere. Um, and um, I found that I am um, using it wherever I can now at this point, because as, as a DevOps guy, I, um, I don't always have control over uh, source code of an application, but um, I, uh, I do have control over say what goes into a, a container cluster or an application stack. Um, and um, it's become a pretty slick tool to solve a bunch of problems. And anytime I come across a, um, a tool that uh, to me is a little bit of a Swiss army knife where I can, I can use it for multiple purposes, I definitely uh, kind of adopt it into my, my tool chain. So um, you described yourself as a DevOps guy. Can you remind everybody what, you, what, is, what, what would you say you do here? Yep. So I, uh, uh, so I lead what's called our RAV team, which stands for Reliability, Automation, and Visibility. Um, it's, uh, it's a blur of um, DevOps and site reliability. Um, so any kind of uh, deployment automation, um, automation around QA, um, uh, 
insight into what's going on with the health of our systems. Uh, so any type of um, visibility we can build around that, um, reliability engineering, and then um, I also do quite a bit with uh, data warehousing and data analytics, uh, both at the um, at the systems level, but also um, uh, interacting with kind of business data as well, gathering data from all sorts of different sources so that we can have it all together for, for business uses. So uh, lots of hats, but it's, it's usually the way I like it. Um, I like to play with a lot of different tech and uh, it's a lot of fun. So. Yeah, yeah, I totally understand that. It's, uh, it's nice to be able to go as as they as they say to be a T shape or an I shape kind of guy, right? Like going wide and being a T shape kind of person is uh, oftentimes fun and interesting. So I I share a lot of that sort of sentiments. Um, now you had also said that you use the ZD host container. Mm -hmm. uh, I also used the ZD host container just the other day. We had a user out in discourse doing some cool stuff with Prometheus mm -hmm. and trying to use. Um, the little templates that we have built into the tunnelers. So trying to reduce the number of services that were necessary. So they had a Prometheus is neat because uh, it scrapes, it wants to reach out and get the metrics from somewhere. It doesn't expect the metrics to be pushed to it. Yeah. And so that provides a problem if your scrape targets are behind firewalls, right? Yeah. And so uh, clearly this user is trying to have a centralized Prometheus server and wanted to scrape a bunch of stuff at a bunch of different locations. And so they've used Tunneler, they put Tunnelers on all the locations. And then um, using, I think it's D, dollar sign DST underscore host name in your service. Basically, if you name your identity in a, a predefined way so that you can address a uh, identity using its name, the, the actually identical, the actually ident actual identity name, then you could have, you know, N targets all scraped by one particular service. So I use the ZD host container yes. with Docker to set up three bespoke Docker networks, no exposed ports in any of those Docker networks. Yep. And then I used um, uh, ZD to you know, connect into that Docker uh, network world that simply wasn't, uh, exposed in any way, shape or form. And it sounds kind of similar maybe to what you were doing. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where do you find yourself using the ZD host container? Like, is there anything, any place in particular? Yeah. I think, um, the one I wanted to highlight and here will be the, uh, moment of truth here. Let me see if I can, can. Mike share his screen, everybody drum roll, yes. please. Stand by. <laughs> Got to find it. Yeah. The, that ZD host container is, the, the the common concept would be reverse proxy. It lets you plant a ZD agent in whatever special network environment that has access to the private services so that you can access them through ZD as a reverse proxy. Yep. And we have liftoff. Sweet. That was sweating a little bit for that, on that one, but we got it working. Excellent. Real, real quick, uh, uh, th there was a question from chat. Oh, yeah. happens to, happens to be from Ken. Does NetFoundry okay. use the same open source ZD that is in GitHub? Same versions? Uh, yes, it does. Um, we run, um, we have a little bit of um, bake time in terms of the day a new release is cut, but we try to we try to keep up with it um, within uh, within a couple versions of uh, the moment a new release comes out. And so we've got a couple networks that we use internally. Um, uh, one in particular where we kind of pilot um, basically the latest versions that get published, but we try to we try to kick the tires and exercise the new versions as soon as they come out, um, and then make them available to um, you know to customers for the for the services that we're hosting as soon as possible too. So very cool. Now I can't help but notice I already see the word Xerox yeah. on the screen. Uh, if people uh, haven't been introduced to Xerox yet, you definitely should check out Xerox.io. Um, very, very cool tool that Michael Quigley has been working on so diligently, uh, and now is free to the public. You should check it out. Um, lets you basically provide public sharing to a private resource or private sharing to a private resource. Uh, so if you haven't checked out Xerox, go check it out. Free to sign up. Uh, it's a cool tool. You should, you should definitely give it a roll. And so Xerox is interesting to us because it's brand new, right? Like, well, yeah. not brand new, but I mean, you know, new enough. And so... Uh, I see some Xerox here. So you're going to yep. you're going to show us how you're using the ZD host container with Xerox in some way? 
Yeah, so um, so this was kind of a fun implementation for, for ZD because um, what you're seeing behind the scenes is our um, application stack for our, uh, our cloud-hosted ZRock, because um, that's one of the offerings we have with ZRock, was you can use our, our public-hosted offering for it. Um, but with any application stack, um, a common problem that people have um, you know, when you're building a production stack is one of the first things you do is you end up, you know, you, you, you want to make sure everything's locked down, everything's got least privilege for your setup. Um, but then, of course, um, developers might need to debug or troubleshoot something. You need to set up some sort of developer access and support. So um, historically, a lot of times what would happen is now you got to... Always, always the developers. Yep. Yeah, so you got you to you know, blow open all the doors and, and, and now create all sorts of um, uh, access points that, you, that you know, mess up your, your nice tight security that you uh, initially spec'd out. And so um, when we did the, the Xerox environment, um, I, I've become a pretty big fan of AWS Fargate just because it is, um, it is a completely serverless container orchestration. So um, the longer I do DevOps, the less I want to worry about VMs. I don't want to administrate servers. Like if, I, if I'm building an application stack, I just want to worry about the stack itself. Um, I don't want to have to worry about um, scaling underlying um, uh, nodes underneath to make sure I've got enough capacity and all that. Um, what I've liked about Fargate is that I don't have to worry about that. I just say, hey, just run my container. And, and uh, I just give it a container definition, and it just runs. And so, um, and I wanted to try and keep the the ZRock environment uh, completely serverless. So basically, an, an entire uh, an account and environment that didn't have any VMs in it at all. Um, so that basically, that's um, from a security standpoint, we don't have to worry about that. And an administration point, um, we don't have to worry about that either. And so. Um, what I ended up doing is that when it came time to figure out, um, you know, developer access, support access, um, as well as um, uh, various things for data warehousing and ETL, um, uh, decided to rely on the ZD host container uh, to be part of the application stack. Um, and so, as you can see with the with our various ECS services here, we've got um, a couple of different parts of it. Um, ZRock Control, ZRock HTTP. That's part of the the ZRock uh, application stack that comes with the, the ZRock binary. Uh, InfluxDB is the, the metric store uh, behind ZRock. Um, and then there's also, not shown here, is also um, a, a Postgres database that's used. But um, key things that we needed to set up for support access, um, we needed support access for InfluxDB. Uh, that, was, that was kind of the initial one, both for bootstrapping and some kind of initial um, debugging and, and setup. Um, and uh, then later came along uh, need, need to be able to interact with with Postgres and kind of um, be able to debug and troubleshoot and things like that. And Mike, uh, uh, Postgres would be the database where correct. Xerox stores data and Influx is a time series database where we put metrics? Correct, yep. Um, so anybody who's used um, Xerox and you see the uh, kind of the cool dashboards that show all your metrics kind of coming by in, in, in near real time. So that's actually InfluxDB behind that. That's powering that. Um, and so... Um, one of the things uh, initially when we launched, I actually ran um, these the Z I'm sorry the ZD tunnel I'm sorry ZD host container as a sidecar to the Influx um, DB um, service. And what was was nice about that is when you do sidecar setup is like you can keep it very very locked down. So basically, um, you know only the only the application can talk to it, and because the the ZD host container is just talking to a local host. Um, it's inside of the same security group, and you can keep it um, very, very restricted and very isolated in terms of how you set up your access control. And so uh, this uh, Amazon Fargate thing has a similar idea that like Kubernetes has of pods where yeah. a sidecar is a, another container that is yeah. delivered next to the one that you like, like Influx or whatever. Is yeah, that... so um, as, as part of a, a service... Um, and, it, and I don't know, I don't know the comparable terminology in, in uh, Kubernetes because we more of an AWS shop, um, at least on my side of the fence. But I, I uh, uh, for for like InfluxDB as part of this InfluxDB service, I can launch I can launch a, a ZD host container as part of it. Or if mm -hmm. I wanted to do something special, where uh, like a, a special monitoring agent, something as a sidecar, 
that mm -hmm. actually becomes encapsulated as part of this service. And then you Does can it, wrap it inside of the, the security group rules for that service if you want. Yeah, I would just call that a sidecar. It's it's yeah. basically the same thing. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like the exact same idea. Yeah, I was just, uh, that's just education for me and for everybody else who might be watching. Yeah. Um, Let's see. Oh, I had a I had a follow up, but then I I forgot what it was. Oh, oh well. Anyway, I'll, uh, I'll chat for a little bit and see if it comes back to you. But um, so so um, after we initially launched that um, fairly quickly afterwards, the need um, arose to be able to interact with uh, uh, PostgreSQL, which is the the database backend for Xerox as well. And I realized it might it might just be easier to have kind of an all purpose developer access um, container that was running. So I actually set up the the Xerox Bastion container. And all this is, is it's running the um, the ZD host container image. Um, if, you, if you search Docker Hub for open ZD, ZD host, um, uh, it's a very, very lightweight container. And the only thing that you need to supply is um, the, uh, uh, is the is it an identity token uh, as as a as a secret to the container. And it basically takes on that identity and becomes a host for, for ZD services. Um, and so, uh, essentially, this is this is now um, kind of the access point for um, developers and support members for InfluxDB, um, PostgreSQL, uh, and then we we've also added uh, recently Rat RabbitMQ as part of the application stack, um, and so we've granted access for that um, as well. Um, and let me, and so uh, you have made the decision then it sounds to not use sidecars, and so you instead of having four. ZD tunnels, you have the one. Is that yep. correct? And and in terms, of, and this is sort of a, a personal preference for how I like to do um, AWS sec security groups. But um, I, I typically I'll build a security group per service, and um, I'll have it so that um, the only the only things that can talk to a security group are other members of the security group. Uh, so essentially, I'll have a um, you know I'll have like an influx DB security group. Um, I will make the Bastion a member of that security group. Um, and it just minimizes and it basically makes it so you don't have to worry about any outside IPs that are ever accessing it. It, it just abstracts it so that there's never any IPs in your security groups at all. Um, it's, it's just basically saying, no, nope, you just have to be a member to, to be able to interact with this port. Um, and so um, so for the, you know, the Postgres security group, the Influx security group, and the Rabbit security group, um, the, this Bastion becomes a member of those. And that that grants the access to where it can talk to the actual endpoints within it. This is a good point for me to stop and ask Ken. Ken, would you like me to relay your question, or would you like to relay your questions? Ken has more questions for you. I was trying to think of questions. <laughs> Feel free to pick them off and throw them into the conversation as if you want, or skip over them. But I was wondering about this one, Mike. The the version. Let's see if we're to pin the version. Um, I am. I am a believer in version pinning. Uh, the, my one downside is occasionally forgetting to go back and and refresh that version. Um, but that's just a kind of an old uh, coming from more of a, an ops background where I did it for a couple of years in a larger environment, um, even with things like RPMs and things like that. Um, where if it's not broken. Don't fix it. Exactly. And it's like, yeah, yeah. If you get in, and, you know, still, it still want to upgrade periodically, but you can upgrade in a, in a planned window where you can monitor that upgrade. Right. Um, Change and, and, control. Yeah. And, and kind of verify that was, that was, a, that was a huge thing at my previous place where, um, you know, all changes needed to be needed to be uh, basically reported and planned and do, done during off hours and things like that. And so all that kind of old school ops stuff is kind of, uh, Totally. definitely drilled into, into me to where it's just like no, just, just just ingrained yep. yeah yeah and gen yep. gently pin the versions and uh, uh every <laughs> once in a while i'll be late i'll be lazy and use latest somewhere and then and then um you know some and, and it'll kick yourself me. later yeah i'll be like I, I should have pinned it i know better and so um i yeah i'm a believer in version pinning but um yeah yeah it's good to know how to use each option i'm just curious how people are actually using it mm -hmm. um there's another one on the same vein about there are two different ways to give the ZD identity to the ZDOS container. I wonder which one you found useful. Um, I ended up using, let's see, there's basically just the environment variable. Let me dig in. As an environment variable. Okay. Yeah. You probably don't want to show that then. Um, well, it's, it's, um, <laughs> it, 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 it'll just, it's basically it's happened just before. <laughs> no, it's, I believe it's happened. It is just the, the ARN of the secret. Cause that's yeah. the other thing that AWS has a, has a built in way to, where it'll do just in time translation of the secret. So from this from the admin panel, it's not set up to reveal any. Um, yeah. 
reveal gotcha. any secrets, but um, let me see if I can go dig up the JSON standby. Yeah, I know you can also pass the one-time enrollment token as standard input, but when for this kind of environment like ECS or Fargate, then it makes a lot of sense to store it as an environment variable so you don't have to set up volumes. Yeah, and... and um, yeah, there it is. Yeah. ZD Identity JSON is the environment variable that you're yep. passing in. And, and our AWS secret. Our, our, our access volume is pretty low, so where it's just like, you know, we might once or twice a week be, be using this. Uh, but I um, also also like this method, too, just in the event that, let's say you want to do HA with this type of setup or you want to be able to have two of them yeah. running. Um, I just uh, um, I like to be able to have them, you know, scale up or down as needed uh, if I ever want that option. Mike, um, is it is it a, a common thing that you do or do you ever look at who uses that service and when? Is that something you can do with ZD? Uh, yes, definitely yes. Um, and let me, let me swing. Yeah, actually, I'll swing over there. Um, I'm wondering if we have this. If we've done it recently. Let me go look. So that's and that's so the we're other looking thing. At, here we're looking at cloud ZD, right? Like, yep. If if uh, people are familiar with the ZD admin console, it's got some some similarities and some major differences. So. Yep. So one of the things that I um, ooh pretty yep um, one of the things that let me see here usage by points um, but of course I was I was on it this morning let me go back seven days this is staging so we haven't used it a whole lot um, but essentially the the other reason I like using ZD for the developer access um, setup is that you, when you get that question of um, you know who's been who's been accessing this service we can actually go um, look at that specific service and 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 see you know uh, or we you know we, we can first go look and say has there been any traffic to this to this service which should be you know support access only um, and and should be controlled monitored and so forth uh, it gives us a way to be able to do that through uh, traffic analysis we can actually go back and see the specific identities that have accessed it and when they actually pass traffic um, and so we'll use that. Um, Let me ask a, a slightly different question. Uh, do yeah. do we often, or is there a reason we have or haven't restricted outbound access from these machines too? So do we set up the security group so that you can only outbound via a tunnel through ZD? Um, I haven't set them up that way. Um, I'll typically do, um, I tend to be pretty liberal on, on uh, outbound access. Um, yep. in security groups, but um, I'll go pretty um, as, as restrictive as possible on the inbound. But if we wanted to, we, we would be able to do that, right? Like, uh, it, regardless of the, uh, you know, actual need for the, the thing to get somewhere it okay. needs to get to. I just mean, like, should somebody try to get into the, the system, we could set it up so that somebody couldn't, like, outbound things that shouldn't go outbound, right? I believe so. I'm less. I, that gets into some of the more complicated service setup that I am less familiar with. So. Yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> okay, that's fair. Yeah, yeah, so, and that's that's uh, truthfully part of the part of what um, um, what I like about ZD is that I, I am not a network engineer, and in terms of um, in terms of in terms of background, that's one area where I do feel weak. And what I sure. what I like about ZD is that it allows me to create that connectivity that I need. Without, uh, without uh, creating network problems, yeah, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Um, without worrying like, about it, right? Yeah, because um, I mean, you, you talked about with uh, at the beginning with that uh, Prometheus example of um, you need to be able to reach a lot of places. So one of one of my backgrounds was uh, kind of old school infrastructure monitoring, which is built around that polling model. So, of course, when I came into a place and one of the first things they had me do was basically rebuild the infrastructure monitoring. One of the one of the first things I had to do was was go meet with uh, the Linux administrator and say, all right, I need you to punch a whole bunch of holes in the firewall uh, for my monitoring tool to be able to go and get to all these places where normally they would be it would be locked down and restricted. Um, and so within you know DevOps and site reliability you end up often being the troublemaker because you are that guy walking around punching holes and everything that everybody works so hard to lock down. But you need it. Um, you must. But you, yeah. you, you need it, yeah, because it's for, for, I mean, there's, and there's a couple of, like, classic DevOps use cases where this is really important. And, and you got, you know, looking at one here, this is, of course, like the developer support access scenario. 
Um, but deployment is another scenario. Typically, your deployment is going to be some something completely separated from your your live environment. Um, and then monitoring is another case, and um, the one that I've um, that also use ZD quite a bit extensively here is um, kind of our ETL processes for um, gathering data. Um, like like what we just saw, right? Warehouse. Yeah. And so um, yep. do, do we have, I don't know if you can share any dashboards that we've, so you've, do you have a dashboard that we've built for staging? Like, is that the sort of thing that you're using for ETL? Is that what you mean? Um, well, it, let me think here. I have one. I don't have one up. I can uh, I'll, I'm pull one up shortly. Um, well, yeah. If not, that's okay. Like I, I, uh, I don't know what we can or should or shouldn't show. You know, I yeah, that's that. I'm, run, I'm running through my mind of any of leaking <laughs> yeah, any yeah, also that, yeah, that we yeah. shouldn't show. So um, let me ask. The, let me ask it differently then. Yeah. So we do have internal dashboards for yeah. say Z Rock and other things, customer networks, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, and the ETL that you're doing specifically for Z Rock, it is through that bastion that you just showed us. Yes. Um, yeah. So the. That's what I was trying to ask. And so so we have some process that extracts, transforms, and loads the ETL process yep. uh, from, like, say, Influx. Does it go to in, from Influx to yep. where does it go? Yeah, so we, it um, go? Yeah, so we have um, we have ETLs. They're going through this bastion, um, and they're fetching data from – they're getting kind of daily roll-up data from Influx DB. And then we also do um, – in every couple hours, it basically grabs a snapshot of the entire um, uh, Postgres database. Uh, mm -hmm. as well. And what it lets us do is we can bring it all together and create business reporting out of that. So, uh, so you, uh, you extract the database in order to put it someplace else to run queries against it. Yeah. So basically we create, um, nice. there's, we create a, like a read only copy of the database. Um, and we've got stuff in there to basically anything that's like a, we have exclusions for anything that's like a sensitive field that we don't want in a, in a, like a business database. And so we'll pull out kind of the stuff that we need um, pull that into a central data warehouse. And what that lets us do is um, it makes, um, you kind of normalize all your data. So whether it's originally time series data or relational data, whatever, it all becomes relational data. Um, and then you can start to just query and join it uh, across data sources um, for, for business purposes. So. And so in the past, you would have had to do all of this with just uh, Amazon security groups. Is that the way you'd have to do it, whitelisting IPs and sort of that sort of thing. Lots of um, whitelisting IPs. Um, you can do it with things like um, uh, all the ones I'm going to list off are, are things that I think about them now. I'm like, oh, I hate doing it this way because to me they're, they're gross <laughs> now. Yeah. Um, but things like you have to whitelist the internet gateway of the other account to be able to to talk right. to yours. But you don't. I mean, that basically says anything running in that account can reach yeah, yeah. And, and query. Um, and then same thing for. Um, I, I'm really not a fan of VPC peering, which is another way in which people do this to where they'll link their VPCs either within an account or across accounts or things like that. And, and um, I'm really not a fan of that either because it's just basically if you have something exposed in one VPC, you're, you're now exposing the entire other VPC as well. Because um, because it, it, it just um, it's not there's not a good way to ensure um, that you know what is actually talking across those those bridges, so to speak, and and uh, yeah, so I, it, it that's that's traditionally how a lot of those are done. That makes and sense. And I, yeah, and, uh, and like no I, I always get because there's a better way. So. Yeah, and I always get uh, goofy, like you know, if you travel and you're at a hotel and you're on the Wi-Fi, you don't want to open that IP, and or if you're at Starbucks or you know wherever you might be, uh, same problem when you're whitelisting IPs, like. Totally, I, I I love the I love the quote. It feels gross now, because yeah. yep. <laughs> it's totally true. Like, and then if you're working with a, a large customer, you know, you know, Microsoft or Google's or whatever, with thousands of employees, and they all ha and they all funnel through an exit node, you basically whitelist everybody. It's just yeah, it can be yep. a mess. Well, and, and things like um, you know managing access to a database, for example, uh, traditionally a lot of places they'll they'll just use an SSH based bastion. Uh, but of course, now now you've got a server that's got ports open. You got to manage SS, SSH keys potentially on that server, and you have to whitelist the IP and manage that as well. Um, again, I, I just like this method because there's just there's no server. All that administration overhead just doesn't exist because because this isn't here. I pop it in the security group. Um, you know, the the developer who who does need access, they can connect straight from their from their IDE as long as they're you know uh, granted access through ZD. So. 
Yeah, that's cool. I think what else? Uh, yeah, I think the the other th reason that um, I like this method and, and one of the reasons I wanted to kind of highlight it because there's all I think we've done probably in the past more focused around kind of Kubernetes and Kubernetes um, environments um, where they it is container orchestration, but you do have servers underneath and, and a popular method is to put, um, you know, ZD tunnel running on those servers and um, this being a, a more unique case to where you don't have any VMs underneath the hood. So how do you, um, you know, how do you set up ZD inside of your cluster? Um, you, you can do you can do an app embedded implementation, which is which is the most secure. Um, but I wanted to highlight this as an option because there's a lot of um, there's a lot of shops where, in terms of how teams are broken up, that's not necessarily going to be an option for them to where they want to be able to get that zero trust as close as they can. Um, but right. for example, the DevOps team, they might not have any influence or control at all over what's happening in the application space. Um, there's, there's some of that dynamic here with, with cloud ZD to where, um, you know, I don't, um, our, our, our cloud ZD is, is Java, for example. Um, I don't want to be in Java. I don't think those guys want me in the Java. Um, and I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't step into that space, um, but I work on the infrastructure side. So how can I create the access that's needed or how can I secure this as needed without having to, um, without kind of having to overlap spaces uh, necessarily. Yeah, it allows kind of a thin line of separation of concerns so that uh, at worst case scenario, let's say we launched an API and said, hey, we want this to be secured in zero trust, um, but hey, but you're not gonna have any ability to, you know, you can't, you can't change the source code, but you, we need to make it as secure as possible. Well, that's fine. I can just run ZD host as a sidecar um, and basically make a dark API, a completely secure API, but I don't have to, right. um, I don't have to get in the developer's space in terms of working within platform specific code. Yeah, and the and the other way too, you don't have to renegotiate the relationship or the preview yep. because you can run ZD as just another app. Yeah, pretty much anywhere. Um, and in the Kubernetes space, that also applies to the namespaces. A lot of Kubernetes oper uh, administrators will use namespaces to carve up their resources and control permissions. So you could yep. do like Helm install ZD host in a namespace in a cluster where namespaces are segregated. And yep. now you've just planted your reverse proxy ZD host agent into that one namespace and it can't talk to anything else. Yep. Yeah. Well, well, I I think uh, oh, go ahead. I was, I was going to say an end being in, um, you know, here, here I work where we've got probably two primary language sets too, but at a, at a previous place, um, it was, uh, I worked where it was three DevOps guys versus about 120 developers. Uh, so you imagine in a space like that, you know, you're doing deployments all the time, you're setting up support types of things all the time. Um, and of course you, you know, you truly have no business doing any interaction with source code and, and some of the stuff may have been there for five years. And so, uh, I think about, you know, trying to make things more secure and zero trust and you get environments like that to where you might be supporting so many teams, but it's like you need a, a language agnostic way to make it zero trust. Um, I like this approach because again, it gets me as close as possible to um, having full end-to-end -end encryption without, um, uh, without me having to worry about what's going on inside of the application. The application can remain a black box, um, but I can still, um, as far as the infrastructure setup, I can still set up zero trust. So. Yeah, and without cool. losing the visibility of what's actually going on for anybody that cares. Yeah. Well, let's yeah. also let's also not lose sight of the fact that once you have your Open ZD overlay network, you could then let those developers start using Open ZD services too, because yeah. you'll have the infrastructure for your your network in place, and hopefully, yeah. then you wouldn't even need to deploy the tunneler because you'll yeah. just be application embedded. That'd be cool. Well, Mike, that is a cool ZDTV. Thanks for showing us a little bit about, uh, you know, how we as NetFoundry go about using OpenZD. I think that was really neat. Appreciate yeah. it. Thanks for having me. This was fun. Yeah, man. Ken, anything from you? Any closing thoughts? No, I'm, I'm, that's pretty cool to see how it's working. Um, you know, feel free to, to ask for more if you think of something that would be great that doesn't seem to exist. Try to... Hear that Push it out. forward. Push it forward. Love it. All right, fellas. Well, thanks for great ZDTV and everybody out there watching. We'll see you next time. Yeah, thanks, guys.